Hey everybody, it's been a while. Yeah, I know. Um, today I am going to be giving you guys my full 2020 NFL playoff predictions now that everything's set in stone. Uh, if you guys enjoy this video, make sure that you drop a like on it, but more importantly to me right now, give me your thoughts in the comment section below. Tell me why I'm stupid, tell me why you're a football genius, and who you have making a run to the Super Bowl. I'll be in the comment section debating with some of you, so let's talk. And before I get started on the playoff prediction video, um, I just kind of want to talk about, I guess, the elephant in the room. Um... I'm not going to start off this video by BSing all of you and saying that I'm coming back to do YouTube in Madden 20. Um, obviously, if you guys don't know this, my channel was pretty much built by playing the Madden video game, but that game just isn't doing it for me, man. Um, if I'm being completely honest, honest, it's just not an enjoyable experience for me, and if I'm not enjoying it, I'm not going to torture all of you with content for it. And I'm honestly, I'm not going to torture myself either. I just don't think it's right for me to do that. And it's certainly not fair to you guys when you're when you're there to watch fun Madden content. And there are just all these amazing content creators out there right now. Go check out people that are making awesome Madden videos. Like if, if you guys like the stuff that I'm making, I really appreciate it. But to me, I just I don't have the love for that game right now. Um, with that said, there are definitely parts of me that miss YouTube, and I actually have a lot of fun still making video content, so don't be surprised if I spent the upcoming NFL offseason making a bunch of videos, probably centered mostly around fantasy football and maybe some daily fantasy sports. So if that's not your thing, I get it, but if it is, I'd really appreciate the support on those upcoming videos, so help your boy out, you know, like them, share them, follow me on Twitter, that sort of thing, um, and it's kind of a transition into that. I wanted to make a 2020 NFL playoff prediction video. I've done these a few times in the past, and they're some of my most successful videos ever. I, I think one of them had like 300,000 views or something crazy like that. It might, be, it might even be way more than that. I don't know. Uh, but it's been really successful for me in the past. So I figure, why not? Uh, it seems like you guys enjoy these videos, like you enjoy the playoff predictions and everything, and I like making them. So you know what? Let's have some fun. That's what YouTube's for, so um, that's what I'm going to be doing. So the 2020 NFL playoffs are going to be getting, uh, beginning this upcoming weekend, and we do finally have a schedule. Um, it doesn't exactly match what's on this graphic in terms of the order that the games will be played in, but I wanted to make it really easy to follow. So why don't we start off in the top left-hand corner of the screen uh, where you're going to see the Tennessee Titans at the New England Patriots. Um, now, most of us would kind of typically look at this and say, easy blowout win for the Patriots, right? I mean, the Titans have not really been uh, a, a playoff contender uh, very often in terms of making deep runs. But the Titans have actually been pretty darn good down the stretch this season. The Patriots had a chance to clinch a first round bye. All they had to do was beat the Dolphins at home in week 17, and they choked it away in one of the most shocking losses of the entire 2019 NFL season. So New England's limping into the NFL playoffs. The Titans seem to be doing pretty well down the stretch, so we have two teams kind of almost headed in different directions right now. Now with that said, this is the New England Patriots in January, coached by Bill Belichick, quarterback by Tom Brady, and I believe that this will be the lowest scoring game of the wild card weekend, and honestly, low scoring games in cold weather typically favor the team that runs the ball best, so that would typically mean Tennessee, right? But I'm not exactly sure that's the case in this one. Um, the Patriots' defensive strategy is really interesting. They've done this for a really long time. They typically take away the opposing team's best player and force the offense to use its complementary pieces. Now, it's more complicated than that. Um, you'll hear that narrative all the time from the media, right? Where they're going to take away the opposing team's best player. It doesn't always go like that. But the thing is, they kind of have somebody to shut down one of the big important pieces of this Tennessee offense, that being A.J. Brown, the rookie wide receiver. I mean, he's been a breakout star this season, and realistically, he could be the offensive rookie of the year, but he's almost certainly going to be shadowed by one of the league's best corners, that being Stephon Gilmore. So that's a, an extremely tough matchup for anyone, let alone a rookie, doesn't have any playoff experience, uh, doesn't understand maybe that the NFL playoffs are sometimes a 
officiated in just completely BS ways where they just allow defensive pass interference for whatever reason. So that could be a really tough matchup for A.J. Brown. I do think that he's good enough, and I do think he'll still make some plays, but I do ultimately think that they're going to have to pass the ball to other players. And right now, if you look at that Tennessee offense, who else is making plays in the passing game with any sort of consistency? Certainly not Corey Davis. So if Gilmore can kind of shut down Brown, that leaves the Titans with pretty much one established offensive weapon, and that's Derrick Henry. So if you look at it like that, the Patriots really have a pretty simple thing that they have to do. They need to sell out to slow down the run, keep Stephon Gilmore and A.J. Brown, and if they do that, I just don't see how the Titans can consistently move the ball up and down against this defense. I do think that the Titans are a difficult matchup for the Patriots. I mean, realistically, if you look at it, you might be able to make the case that other than the Ravens, the Titans are the worst matchup for the Patriots. Um, But I do actually think that they are going to get the win in this one. Um... It's, it's going to be a close one, and I like I said, I think it's going to be the lowest scoring game in Wild Card Weekend, but the Patriots, if they do get the victory, it's going to be, like I said, I, I don't think it's going to be a blowout by any means, but uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if Tennessee wins, but that would mean, obviously, that they're going to move on. Uh, they will automatically face Kansas City in the divisional round of the playoffs. So the other game then would be Baltimore at, or uh, excuse me, not Baltimore, Buffalo at Houston. Um And this one's kind of interesting because I think both of these teams are essentially coming off of a bye, given that they rested most of their starters for the majority of their Week 17 games. Neither of them really had anything to play for. Um, The Texans, they're not really that strong right now. They haven't won a game by more than three points since since, uh, November 3rd. And if you look at the Bills... They had lost two of their previous three to the Ravens in week 14 and then to the Patriots in week 16. So they're kind of limping into the playoffs as well. It's it's really interesting right now. Uh, both of these teams are kind of uh, among the weakest going into the playoffs right now of all the playoff teams, in my opinion. And that makes it kind of difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, If you look at it, the Bills on paper definitely have the stronger defense, but their offense is also extremely inconsistent. They've got Josh Allen looking like an all-pro on one throw, and then the next throw he looks worse than Blake Bortles. It's really weird. I mean, that type of inconsistency, it's often the downfall of teams, particularly in the playoffs, just because you can't withstand a loss. You know, um, over the course of a season, a regular season, one loss isn't a big deal, but in the playoffs, you cannot lose a game. You have to be consistent. And uh, that's been the downfall of the Bills quite a few times this season. If you look at the Bills' losses, Josh Allen has completed less than 50% of his passes in the Bills' losses. That is wild. I know he's a player who does more for his team than just complete passes, but I mean, that's a major issue. And I really do think it's going to lead to the the eventual demise of the Bills. Whether it happens in this first wild card weekend, I, I just think eventually when the Bills do have to go on the road and face either the Ravens or the Chiefs or the Patriots or somebody like that, they have to play these tough defenses. And Josh Allen just is not going to be equipped to do that. And if you look at the Texans, their offense is also capable of putting up some big numbers. So that would leave them with you know, a pretty strong advantage on the offensive side of the football. Obviously, they do have to go up against that Bills defense, which is pretty good. So I think that the Texans right now, after that kind of the essential buy that they had in Week 17, um, their starters should be healthy on offense. I think that they're going to be able to at least move the ball and put up some points. So I do think that the Texans are going to walk away with the victory in this one. I think it's going to be a close one, maybe a score like 24 to 20 or something like that, probably relatively low scoring as well. Um, but again, this could go either way, man. It really could. Uh, if Josh Allen's on, they could win this game. But uh, I think ultimately Josh Allen is kind of trash if we're being completely honest with you, <laughs> if I'm being completely honest with you. So uh, yeah, let's move on to the other side of the bracket, the NFC. We have Seattle at Philadelphia. Um, and I actually want to start off in the bottom right hand corner of your screen here where you're going to find uh, the NFC East champion Eagles hosting the Seattle Seahawks. I mean, 
most people are looking at this like, how do the Seahawks have to go on the road to face the Eagles? And the NFL at some point is probably going to have to change the rules um, because it it just seems silly to have a team with like two or three more victories than the other team going on the road in the playoffs to face that team. It just seems bizarre um, just because the one team won their division. Like, even if the Seahawks had murdered the Eagles earlier this season, it wouldn't matter. Like, the, the tiebreaker isn't that. It's who won their division. It's really just dumb. So, I think at some point they're going to have to make the change on that. But uh, for right now, the Eagles are the home team. And most people are probably going to tell you that this is going to be an easy blowout victory for the Seahawks. I mean, the NFC East is terrible this season. Both the Eagles and the Cowboys seemingly didn't even want to win their division. The entire division has pretty much been a laughing stock the whole season. But if you're looking for my bold prediction in the playoffs, this is it. The Eagles beat the Seahawks. I know, it sounds crazy, but hear me out. The Eagles have essentially been playing playoff games for the past month of the season. They needed to win every game they've played in order to make the playoffs. And they've done it. It hasn't always been pretty, but they finished their season with four straight wins with their backs against the wall. Meanwhile, Seattle's coming off back-to-back losses. They've lost three of their past four. And yeah, I understand. Week 17's loss against the 49ers, they're the one seed in the NFC. They could have, you know, that's not a bad loss by any means. It was extremely close. They could have won that game. But they also lost by multiple scores to the Rams and the Cardinals down the stretch. I mean, this is a team right now that could have the number one seed in the NFC if they had just beaten bad teams. So if you're looking at the Eagles and saying they're a bad team, I don't know. I'm not saying that they're kryptonite's bad teams or anything. I'm just saying I don't think Seattle's as strong as people want to believe. I mean, this is a team that had a chance to to win their buy or get their buy, and all they had to do was winning win any of those games. And meanwhile, the Eagles have won four straight. Granted, not against amazing competition, I understand, but still four straight victories. And I'm not someone who necessarily believes in momentum, at least not to the degree that a lot of other people will tell you, but I think that the Eagles are a pretty confident bunch right now. Of course, it's worth noting that the Eagles did host and lose to the Seahawks back in week 12, but that was a really bizarre game. If you look back at it, I mean, Russell Wilson threw for 200 yards against a really bad Philadelphia secondary because Seattle's coaching staff was just like content running the ball. Carson Wentz wasn't particularly great in that game. I mean, he did throw two picks, but I just think that the Eagles were in a different spot as a team at that point. They didn't have any confidence. They weren't playing particularly well. The bottom line is the Eagles need guys like Zach Ertz to get back, be healthy, to give themselves another viable pass catching weapon. But I really think that the home field advantage in this one is going to play a a factor. I think that the Eagles are the sleeper team. I think that's possible Seattle might be looking forward to the divisional round, and they might be looking past Philly, and I think that's going to be a mistake. I think this is a sleeper game, and it's going to shock a lot of people when Philadelphia beats Seattle. The other NFC game then, New Orleans and Minnesota. If you see where I put that Eagles logo, that should tell you where I'm going with the Saints and Vikings game. This is a rematch of the 2018 NFC Divisional Playoff game that ended with the, the, that uh, mini, mini, what do they call it? The Minneapolis Miracle, I guess. Um, I, I'm from Minnesota, by the way. I know how to say Minneapolis. I was just fumbling over my words. Uh, but the walk-off touchdown by Stephon Diggs, it's not going to be quite so miraculous this time, though I don't think, for the Vikings. I mean, they've really been missing their running back, Dalvin Cook, who ended up not winning the rushing title, mostly because of a shoulder injury that kept him out in Week 16 and 17, along with most of Week 15. So it's just been tough for them down the stretch. And, and I understand it's not often that a running back impacts an offense as much as Dalvin Cook has, but we've seen some pretty bad results when Dalvin Cook's been out. I mean, it hasn't helped that the team's also been without backup Alexander Madison, but the point that I'm really going for is that the Vikings need Dalvin Cook to get as healthy as possible before this weekend's game against the Saints, uh, if they want to have a chance. If you look at the Saints, on the other hand, I mean, these guys are just on fire heading into the playoffs. They've won six of their past seven. The only loss came on a last-second touchdown in the final seconds against the 49ers. 
most importantly, their offense is just absolutely lighting up the scoreboard. Like, they almost reminds me of the Saints when they were just scoring and scoring and scoring and scoring years ago, where they just had the number one offense and it just wasn't even close. It's very similar to that right now, but they're not getting that type of credit because you look at Baltimore and they're scoring a ton of points. And we've got a couple other offenses like the uh, 49ers and a couple others that have been putting up so many points that the Saints don't look quite as extravagant as they did back then, but they're averaging 36 points per game over their most recent seven game stretch. The Vikings have some offensive firepower and Kirk Cousins has quietly been pretty good throughout most of the season, but they do not want to get in a battle offensively with the Saints. It's just not going to go well for them. So they really need Dalvin Cook back. They need to grind this game out and hope that they're just able to win that time of possession battle, that they're able to keep the Saints offense off the field as much as possible, pick up those first downs. All the narrative, blah, 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 blah. I hate saying that running the football is the best way for the Vikings to win this game because I think that running the football in a lot of, in in most cases, honestly, is not advantageous. But when you're looking at the Vikings and the way that they need to win games right now against the Saints, I just don't think that they have the passing game offensive firepower that they need to, to compete with them. So, I think that grinding the football between the tackles with their running backs and just hoping to avoid turnovers, that kind of thing, winning a game 20 to 17 or something like that is how they need to win this game. What's funny is that if the Vikings could have just beaten the Packers and and had a chance to win the division that way, I think their playoff run might look so much different than it does, but they don't get a playoff home game. They, they're on the road against New Orleans, and I just don't think this looks good for them. So I'm going to take the Saints by double digits in this one. Um, I think that they win by at least 10, and, I, and obviously then they'll move on to face the Packers in Green Bay in the divisional round. So let's move over back again to the AFC side, the divisional round of the playoffs. And uh, the first game that we're going to look at is Houston at Baltimore. And this game actually happened earlier this season, and it did not go well for the Texans. Okay, they were absolutely murdered in this one, 41 to seven. Lamar Jackson threw for four touchdown passes. Team rushed for 250 yards. And I mean, I do think that they're going to look better in their second matchup. The the Texans will than they did in the first, but. This team is just a not it's just not a good fit to be the team that knocks off the Ravens right now. They're just they're not set up in such a way to compete with a team like Baltimore. If they somehow end up being able to face somebody else, that could be a different story. But if they have to go to Baltimore, that is just going to be brutal. I do not see a way that they're able to make that happen. So, um I see Lamar Jackson terrorizing this defense once again. I'm not sure it even matters whether Mark Ingram is back on the field yet by this game. I've got Baltimore winning this one fairly easily. I think it's going to be something like 31-17, something like that. Pretty big victory for the Ravens. Um, I don't think Houston stands much of a chance, unfortunately. So let's look at the other divisional playoff game in the AFC, and that's going to be New England on the road at Kansas City. The Patriots knocked the Chiefs out of the playoffs in both 2016 as well as 2019, so there's no question that the Chiefs are going to be looking to extract some revenge here in the divisional round. Now, these teams are actually squaring off for the second time this season. They played back in Week 14 in New England when the Chiefs were able to get the 23-16 to victory, and I think that game is actually quite telling of how these two teams are right now. The Chiefs kind of struggled to move the ball on offense in that game, particularly on the ground, but their offensive woes were nothing in comparison to to New England's. Tom Brady threw the ball 36 times in that one, but for just 169 yards, one touchdown and an interception. The Patriots' leading rusher in that game was James White, who rushed the ball for 33 yards. I think he had like six carries, and their second leading rusher was the lightning quick guy that we know as Tom Brady who added 20 rushing yards. So yeah, they struggled in that game on the ground. New England is just, honestly, right now on offense, they're garbage. Like, it's crazy to see, but that's just where we're at right now with this Patriots team. They have one true established pass-catching weapon, and they have zero downfield explosiveness. I mean, if you want to count James White out of the backfield as a pass-catching weapon, fine. But he's he doesn't look like the same guy that he did a couple of years ago. He's not getting used as often, things like that. It's just it's difficult right now. The only guy that they have that does anything really in the passing game with any sort of consistency is Julian Edelman. And, I mean, if you look at it, teams have 
keyed in on this reality. And without a player like Rob Gronkowski or Josh Gordon who can stretch the field and make those safeties play back, opposing defenses are crowding the box. They're negating the run. They're forcing the Patriots to pass to pass the ball. But New England, they're extremely one-dimensional with their passing game. Their timing has to be perfect. Those rub routes have to not get called for pass interference. Brady has to be perfect with his accuracy. The players have to make plays after the catch. I mean, the, the Chiefs don't have a great defense, but they have the potential to make things really difficult on Tom Brady once again. And I think the big reason for it is actually because their own offense can be so dangerous. I mean, you look back at that game that they had earlier this season against the Patriots, they only scored 23 points in that game, but they were ahead on the scoreboard by 17 points at halftime. That forced New England to have to pass the ball much more than they wanted to, and that's exactly what the Chiefs want. Their weakness on their defense has been stopping the run all season, but if they can get ahead on the scoreboard, they can sell out on stopping the pass, and then it becomes a nightmare for New England. Look, I believe Tom Brady is the best football player ever. You watch my Twitter account. You've seen my other videos where I say this. I think he's the best quarterback ever. I I think he's the best football player ever. And it's almost sacrilegious for me to say this in a way. But I believe this is the year that they don't make it to the AFC Championship. I'm taking the Chiefs in this one. So on to the NFC side. We've got the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, they've got their complimentary home game out of the way, and now they have to head on the road, and they have the unfortunate luck of getting matched up against the top seed in the San Francisco 49ers. Now, the 49ers have been living on the edge with razor-thin victories and losses in five straight games to close out the regular season. And I know I talked up the Eagles, and they've been on this run as of late, but I think it comes to an end here against the 49ers. I mean, San Francisco hasn't been perfect, but they've been pretty good at winning games that they should win. The only real exception came back in Week 15. They played the Falcons. They surprisingly lost that one on a last-second touchdown. But... Honestly, if you look at the 49ers, the teams that they should beat, they've pretty much stopped most of them. I think they're going to be a pretty big favorite in this one against the Eagles. Now, Philadelphia is probably better than most people want to give them credit for, but the 49ers are just that juggernaut of a team. They've been good since the start of the season, and they've really done nothing to prove themselves as not being an elite team. They've been good all season long, not not in stretches since the very beginning. So I think San Francisco wins this one relatively easily. They head to the NFC Championship, and they're going to host the winner of the next game between the New Orleans Saints and the Green Bay Packers. Now, the narrative around this one is going to be Drew Brees versus Aaron Rodgers, right? But if you look at Aaron Rodgers' season-long statistics, they look pretty good. And the reality of the situation, though, is that it really hasn't been much of a competition if you want to compare those two quarterbacks this season. Drew Brees is playing like the best passer in the entire league right now, and his weapons are showing up for him. I mean, you look at Michael Thomas, he set the NFL's all-time single-season reception record. Brees had that single-game record where he completed the most passes or the highest completion of passes or whatever it was, but... I mean, he's putting up records at this age. I mean, it's crazy at this point. The Packers' defense is greatly improved from where it was a couple of seasons ago, but they're still just not at the point where they have that lockdown pass coverage that they're going to need to stop this New Orleans passing attack. I mean, the Packers do have the benefit of home field advantage here in this game, but that I just don't think that that is going to be enough. The Midwest Januaries are no joke, and I mean, I get that it's a Packers home game in Lambeau Field and everything, but man, I don't know. I mean, you think about it, and it's like, it it just seems so weird that given that the Packers have Aaron Rodgers behind center, a poor weather game might actually help the Packers, who have been running the ball pretty well this season with that duo of uh, Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams. Uh, It just seems so weird to me, Uh, but uh, to me, the Packers are the two seed in the NFC, and I I just think that they're almost like fraudulent or something. I don't even know how to describe it. Like, they've won five straight, but three of those those wins have come against the Redskins, the Bears, and the Lions, and they've only won those games by an average of just over five points per game. So they're not blowing out these bad teams, and they've been held to 24 or fewer points in seven of their past eight games. They've averaged just 20 points over that seven-game stretch. So... You look that and com- look at that and compare it to the Saints, who over or excuse me that eight game stretch for the Packers, um, but 
if you look at the Saints, who've averaged 36 points per game over their past seven games, and I mean, man, that's a 16-point difference down the stretch here on offense alone. Obviously, they're playing different teams, different circumstances, I get it, but that is a huge, huge, huge difference. And if you look at that data just alone, I think that you can't really make the case that things look good for the Packers. Um it seems crazy to, to say this, but I think that the difference in this game is going to be that the Packers offense is just not strong enough right now to keep up with the Saints. So I've got New Orleans heading into Green Bay, knocking off the Packers 30 to 24. So let's head now to the AFC Championship game. We're going to have the Kansas City Chiefs heading to Baltimore to face the Ravens. Um, the final four teams, the Chiefs, Ravens, Saints, and 49ers. Um, if the Ravens get here, they're likely going to be playing against either the Patriots or the Chiefs, in my opinion. We know that New England is the more established playoff team, but what's crazy is that if you're a Ravens fan, you probably are hoping to face the Patriots as opposed to the Chiefs. You do not want to face that Kansas City team. I mean, the Ravens blew out the Patriots earlier this season, and the Chiefs actually stole a close one from Lamar and the guys back in September. Um, September's a long time ago. I get it. Baltimore has been on an absolute tear as of late, but still the chiefs are a team that's equipped to score with them. And I just don't think many other teams in the NFL right now are the problem with Kansas city is that their run defense is not well equipped to take on the Ravens running game. Um, if you look at that game back in week four, when these teams played the Ravens ran the ball for over 200 yards in that game. And while they fell short, it gives us an idea of that mismatch that Baltimore has when they've got the football. Kansas City's weakness on defense, run defense. Obviously, Baltimore's offense built around that amazing running game that they have with Lamar Jackson and everybody else kind of surrounding him. So that specifically, I think, is a really dangerous combination for the Kansas City Chiefs, especially when you consider that they've got to go on the road here to play Baltimore. Now, the Chiefs did move the ball uh, up and down the field against Baltimore in that game earlier this season, but it's worth considering that the, that game was played in Kansas City at home for the Chiefs, and the Ravens' defense also didn't have Marcus Peters, who joined the team in October, and he's been a big difference maker for them. They're playing a lot better with Marcus Peters, or at least they're forcing more turnovers, so there could be a big difference. Um, Patrick Mahomes did not throw an interception in that game. I'm not saying Marcus Peters is ne necessarily going to pick him off, but um, you add that extra threat defensively as a, from a guy who can be a playmaker, and that could change things. Of course, the Chiefs didn't have Tyreek Hill at that time either, so the Peters addition might be kind of a moot point in the end. Um, either way, this is going to be another offensive shootout, in my opinion. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the Chiefs walk away with the win, but I'm going to go with Baltimore in this one. The Ravens are 7-1 seven, seven and one at home this season, and uh, to me, they just seem like they're well-equipped to do more damage on the ground against Kansas City's weak front seven. So um, I think in the playoffs, they're going to be able to get this job done here in Baltimore. So let's go over to the NFC side here in New Orleans at San Francisco. Um, if you're looking for offensive shootouts, obviously we talked about the Kansas City-Baltimore game potentially being one that you should watch. But also, this game specifically, it, I don't know that that Kansas City-Baltimore game can even hold a candle to this one. I mean, New Orleans and San Francisco, guys, these teams battled back and forth scoring 94 combined points back in week 14 when the 49ers narrowly eked out a win by a final score of 48-46. to Jimmy Garoppolo and Drew Brees combined for a whopping nine touchdown passes in that game. Uh, Drew Brees even ran for another one. They scored 10 touchdowns between the two of them. It was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the game was super entertaining, and I'm just really hoping that we can see it again here in the NFC Championship. Uh, obviously, this time it'll be in San Francisco as opposed to the previous time being in New Orleans. Um, I think what's most interesting about these teams is that they're so similar to one another, specifically offensively. I mean, if you look at the pieces that they have, a lot of them are relatively interchangeable. Like if a guy gets injured, Alvin Kamara goes down and say um, Latavius Murray steps in. He's still been super productive. I mean, a lot of these players that they have, they've been missing offensive linemen. I mean, there's been all kinds of different issues between these teams. But the one constant being their quarterbacks, and then they've had their two big pass catchers. Obviously, you've got Michael Thomas for the Saints. You've got George Kittle for the 49ers. And those players, those core four type kind of players, I guess, are really the thing um, that is kind of propelling the rest of the offenses around them. So 
both of these offenses are kind of designed to spread the defense out, air the ball down the field, but that also allows them some wide running lanes for their running backs because they often have these high yards per carry games when the defenses are just kind of left out of position. They're trying to stop this crazy passing attack that the opposing offense has. And then the 49ers or the Saints will just hand the ball off and then their guy gets six, seven yards of carry. So it's very interesting to watch these teams. Like I said, they're very similar stylistically on offense. Um, the both obviously coaches that they have, both head coaches are, are offensive masterminds in, in their own ways. So um, it's going to be a fun one to watch. New Orleans has been scoring at this just insane pace down the stretch. Um, and I'm pretty much going to pick them to beat any team coming out of the NFC right now. The only exception is the San Francisco 49ers. Um, I believe that the 49ers are the most well-balanced team in the NFC right now. And while their defense seems to have taken a bit of a step back from the dominant force that it was early in the year, they're still a really good unit. And most importantly, they've shown the offensive firepower that they would need to keep up with the Saints. They like to run the ball, but they're not afraid to throw the ball 35, 40 times if they have to. So um, I, like I said, I believe that they're the best team in the NFC right now, and I've got them winning another fairly high-scoring game here. I'm thinking something like 31-28, to 28, so it should be another pretty high-scoring, fun game to watch uh, in the uh, NFC Championship. So that will leave us to Super Bowl 54 Baltimore Ravens, San Francisco 49ers, um, the final game of the NFL season, a rematch of Super Bowl 47. Um, yes, I predicted that the two top seeds would make it. Sue me. I mean, this isn't a make a controversial statement video. I really do think that these two teams are going to meet in the Super Bowl. So, um, you know, hey, it is what it is. So what do I think is going to happen? I mean, for starters, we can look back at week 13 when these teams faced one another in Baltimore with the Ravens taking that game by a final score of 20 to 17. Both teams ran the ball extremely well in that one. Lamar went for 100 yards or 101 yards, I guess, technically, and a touchdown on the ground. Mark Ingram ran for an additional 59 yards. For the 49ers, it was the Raheem Mostert show. He carried the ball 19 times for 146 yards and a score. This was such a close game back and forth, and each team only scored three points in the second half. Um, it was a really grinded out type of second half between two pretty good offensive teams and two good defensive teams. I mean, I think these are the two, if you really look at it up and down, probably the two most well-balanced teams in the league. The difference in that game was really, it came down to the kicking, oddly enough. Uh, Ravens kicker Justin Tucker was perfect, as usual, right? But 49ers kicker Robbie Gould, who's usually also very good, missed a second quarter 47-yard field goal. That ended up being the difference on the final scoreboard. So, um, you know, again, very close, could have gone either way, probably could have gone to overtime even. And uh, I think the most interesting thing from that game for me was kind of that the 49ers seemed to have an answer for Lamar Jackson when it came to throwing the ball. Um, you know, obviously we know Lamar is just an absolute bump, just a beast running the football, right? But they held him to a season worst 105 yards passing, just 4.6 yards per attempt, which was also his worst number of the season. 60.9 completion percentage was his third worst of the regular season. Um, you know, again, he's a dual threat type of player. Obviously, running the ball helps open up that passing game for the for the Ravens, but it seems to me like if he can't figure out how to throw the football against this 49ers defense, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to move the ball with any sort of consistency against this 49ers team. Um, and the 49ers offense is looking a lot better down the stretch than they were earlier in the season or even throughout the middle part of the season, so... I think that the 49ers have a good chance to move the ball pretty effectively through the air in this game, more effectively than they did in the first game. Maybe they're not quite as effective running the ball, but I still think they get somewhere around 100, 120 yards rushing as a team. And I think that's going to be enough. I think they flipped the script in this one. I think they win by three as well. Final score, 23 to 20. Your San Francisco 49ers are the Super Bowl 54 champions. So what do you guys think? What did I get right? 
Where did I go wrong? Let me know in the comment section below. I know this was a super long video. If you stuck it out, thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed the content. Um, stop by again. Let me know what happens uh, on your side of the brackets. Do you think that another team is going to win the Super Bowl? Or if you have some other comments for me, I will be commenting down below. If you guys leave comments for me, if you have questions, if you have um, comments about what I've done here in this video, I'm more than happy to talk it out with you. Maybe you can change my mind. So thanks again, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll talk to you guys again.